welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a spine tingling continuation in the fantastic series by the wonderful Big Bad Wolf. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, why not hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled I'm a different kind of police officer. I've got my partner involved in something he doesn't quite understand. Part 6. Let's get straight into that. The first case Douglas and I took on as partners in the major crime unit is still my favourite, back before any of this shit began. It was a pretty grisly homicide case, where the individual had severely beat and tortured his girlfriend before killing her in cold blood. He had such an extensive criminal history of domestic violence that I wondered how he was able to still walk the streets. With rap sheets like this, we knew he would be well acquainted with the best lawyers money could buy. Therefore... We had to walk on eggshells when it came to the case we were working up against him. To make a long story short, we found ourselves face to face with this man after weeks of correcting warrants and compiling evidence. Douglas has always had such a calm demeanour and he was able to execute a flawless arrest where I wanted nothing more than to rip this guy's throat out. He always kept me civil and I am a better officer because of him. His calm gentle personality bundled with his ability to control his emotions were what I had hoped would surface that night. I knew he would change. I stared back, unblinking, into his perfectly golden eyes for what seemed like hours. I was snapped out of my trance as my grandfather took a step closer to my partner, still lying on the couch, with his mouth agape in horror. As he did, Douglas's eyes quickly shifted to my pop and away from my stare. It was at that moment that Douglas released the most bone-chilling, painful scream that I could continue to hear in my nightmares to this day. Tess was the first to react. Having seen this happen many times before, she knew the protocol and the severe pain my partner was enduring. She ran to her cabinet, quickly rummaging through her vials and herbs. My grandfather ran to the bathroom connected to the living room and started a shower. I threw my arms around my partner, my best friend, as he thrashed around and fought. I could feel Douglas's bones snapping and muscles twisting. I held my face against his chest, fighting back tears as his half-formed claws shredded the couch cushions to his sides. Ryan, get him to the shower! My pop yelled over my partner's agonizing screams. I struggled to gather Douglas in my arms as he furiously fought through the pain of the transformation. My grandfather had done this scenario a few times with me. I knew to place him in the steaming hot shower in a sitting position. This action decreased the pain as his mind shifted from focusing on the agony to an instinctive attempt to keep from literally drowning. During the initial transformations, our God-given instincts are dialed up to 1,000. I climbed into the shower with him and pinned him down to keep him from destroying the porcelain bath. Tess rushed into the bathroom with some kind of leaf covered in a sticky substance in her hand. She held it out to me. Rub this on his temples. It will ease the pain if only for a little bit. I grabbed it from her hand and proceeded to do as she said. After a few moments, his thrashing subsided and was replaced with a quick twitching motion every few seconds. And it was at this point that I was able to stand back and look over his body. The fur that was sprouting from his body was thick and pitch black. His ears had become rounded and his teeth were replaced with huge sharp incisors, similar to mine and my grandfather's. He laid still, eyes still blinking as he stared off into the distance. What the hell was that shit you gave him? I said as I glanced over at Tess and she hung her head. It's a temporary paralysis potion, she mumbled. It shuts down the pain, receivers in the brain. His body will continue to shift, but he will feel much less of it. I couldn't help but huff. Where was this stuff when I had my first changes, I thought. Almost like she read my mind, she smiled. It's new. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't entirely sure it would work, but I'm sure glad it did. 
Douglas continued to morph before my eyes. His muscles bulged, his body rearranging while he lay in a state of paralysis. I jumped up as my pop spoke, Panther, and he grunted. Panthers were not native to this area. I knew that meant that whatever this creature that had bit him had multiple genes from different species. I wondered to myself where those bastards were able to get DNA from a were panther. The rest of the night, into the dawn, my partner shifted and spent more time howling in pain than his numbered state. My grandfather left Douglas and I in the care of Tess, grumbling something about him going to take care of some business. And before he left, he had scrawled down information that he was able to <clears throat> extract from the big fucker. We moved Douglas to Tess's bed as his human form began to take back over his body. As he rested, I decided it would be a good time to read over what my pop had written. Vernon was written in huge letters across the top of the page. I read over the barely intelligible notes, piecing together the facts in my mind. Whoever this Vernon dude was, he was a bad motherfucker. Turns out, he had returned to the area with many more followers, all of them some kind of genetic mixture of different creatures. He was hiding out somewhere deep in the mountains, with his trusty cult following at his side. As I read the information, something stuck out to me. My name was scrawled down with a question mark next to it. I had to ask my pop about it when he returned. I yelped as I was pulled from my thoughts as I felt a hand grab my arm. I looked over to see Douglas, an exhausted grin on his face. Dude, that was a motherfucking roller coaster. He managed to let out a raspy, quiet chuckle. I smiled. Remember when I told you under the old oak tree that it doesn't hurt anymore? He nodded. It's a real bitch the first few times. He coughed weakly. I got up and went to the kitchen to get him some water and brought it to him. I put it to his lips and he frantically drank until it was empty. Ain't this a sight? He laughed. I always knew your ass would be hand-feeding me. Just thought we'd be old as shit when it happened. I grinned. At least he had kept his humour. We sat there until the early afternoon, as I told him what I saw and explained what he was. And after a while, my partner gave me a stern look. What about the big fuck that did this to me? I sat quietly for a few moments, looking for the right words. Douglas, Pop has his ways of hmm, handling these kind of situations. I cautiously continued. He managed to get some information out of him, but we are at a bit of a situation, man. He rolled his eyes and then closed them. But you have to rest before you go back into the game. There are certain boxes we have to check when a human is turned. He opened his eyes and stared intently at me, waiting for my explanation. I shrugged. That you can control it. He smiled and threw up his hands. Do me a favour, Rai? As a friend and partner? He asked with a solemn look on his face. I nodded as he continued. If I can't control it, promise me you'll put me down before I hurt someone. I'm a different kind of police officer. I got my partner involved in something he doesn't quite understand. Part 7. Let's get straight into that. Douglas and I have made the best of our short career in law enforcement. That man has had my back in every case I've taken the lead in, and he has stood by my side in court to back me up in every hearing. If I got into a fight while making an arrest, Douglas would jump in swinging without a second thought. I couldn't ask for a better partner, and I couldn't ask for a better friend. The fact that there was a chance that I would have to kill him was one that I could not accept. The days rolled by and Douglas regained his strength a little more each day. He had survived against all odds, yet he had not had another transformation. And this was a good thing. It meant that his mind was strong enough to resist the change. For reference, I battled my change for three days after my initial shift. Douglas was already doing very well for a bitten human. That's not to say that he didn't have his moments every now and again, and I would catch him staring off into a corner of the room absent-mindedly, and have to snap him out of the state. I'm fighting it, he'd say as he snapped back into reality. I believed him. I could only watch on as he fought with himself as he tried to get some rest. 
It was as if one side of him was attempting to override the other, and he was the one fighting both battles. However, his strength and sense of control were traits that I still envy to this day. Eventually, though, we had to know what he was capable of, and if he had control of it. We decided on the next night of a full moon, for both sight and theatric purposes, to put Douglas to the test. The moon doesn't affect us like horror movies suggest, but it does make us a little crazier. Even in law enforcement, we swear that we arrest more and get more calls on the night of a full moon. Douglas was all for this idea. He wanted to test his ability to control himself on the hardest night of the month. And thank God we were working only that case and still had personal leave from work. My pop and I sat on the back porch of Tess's cabin, watching as the sun disappeared across the horizon. You know, Ryan, my grandfather spoke first. If he loses control, you need to understand that it's not your fault. I have seen very few human beings bitten by our kind who have survived, much less stayed in control. His eyes drifted over to where Tess and Douglas were, as I choked back the tears at the thought of what he was preparing me for. Tessa sat cross-legged on the ground behind Douglas, and I, my pop, was leaned against the porch column. I turned to them and broke the eerie silence for the first time in a few minutes. Douglas and I will go to the designated spot that I have chosen. I will explain the shift to him and allow him to fully change. I grimaced as I saw a silver glint in my grandfather's hand. I will stay shifted and if there's a problem, I will handle it. Despite the strong emotional barrier I had been working on leading up to this night, my voice still managed to crack as I spoke those last few words. My pop walked up to us and handed me a long, sheathed knife. My hand shook helplessly as I took it from him. Pop then went over to Douglas and used his hand to bring my partner's forehead to his own. Son, he started, with a hint of sadness in his voice. I have faith in you. I understand that whatever happens, I am thankful for you to have been taking care of my grandson over the years as I have been gone. And I respect the hell out of you for facing this challenge, prepared for what could be the outcome. You're a strong young man, and if worst happens, know that I will make sure your mother and father are taken care of. He hugged Douglas, and I could swear I saw a tear fall from his eye as he turned to go back to the porch. Douglas looked at me with an incredible smile of peace. Where to, boss? he asked. I wished that I, if I ever came face to face with death, that I would stare it in the eyes with a smile as Douglas was this night. I turned and began walking, glancing back at my pop and Tess before we disappeared into the forest. We're going to the old oak, I stammered, still trying to keep my emotions together. Ah, <sighs> Douglas smiled. You always loved your fucking theatrics. He then laughed as he looked up at the bright full moon shining above us. We reached the old oak, a strange intimidating beauty outlined by the glow of the moon. I held my silver dagger clipped onto the back side of my jeans pocket. All right, brother, you gotta focus, I started. Focus on your muscles, your ligaments and all of your limbs. The trick is to push the beast out for a full transformation. He nodded and closed his eyes before snapping them open again. Ryan, in case things go to shit here, I want to thank you, he said with a sincere look in his eyes. I couldn't have asked for a better partner or friend. I grabbed him and hugged him tightly. I couldn't either, brother. He pulled away, with both arms still on my shoulder. But please, he begged, don't let me become a monster. Please use that silver dagger. It's what I want and I don't want you to be afraid to do what's necessary. I took a deep breath and exhaled, dropping my head down in a process. I was holding back my sadness, my grief, and it was getting harder. I looked back up at his eyes. You have my word, brother. And with that, Douglas brought his arms to his side and closed his eyes. Here goes nothing, he chuckled. He held his head up and started to tremble. His body shook as it began to contort and shift. Strangely enough, he did not appear to be in any pain as he transformed. I quickly burst into my shift and sat back on my haunches as I watched in amazement. He had completely transformed 
But what happened next I will never be able to explain the fear that rushed through my veins. As soon as his transformation was complete, Douglas bolted off to the right and into the forest. Terrified, I ran after him, clutching the silver-sheathed knife in my claws. Holy shit, he was fast. I ran, following his scent after I had lost him in my vision. Before I knew it, I had burst through a clearing, the same clearing we had been to before. What I saw there, I will remember for the rest of my life. There was Douglas, fully transformed into his panther state, but he was not alone. Before I knew what was happening, Douglas lunged at the horned creature in the middle of the meadow. A fury of claws and teeth thrashed about as he began to attack the beast, snarling and biting for its neck. Still, in shock, I could only watch in horror, and then I began to smell that copper scent of blood in the air. Before I had a chance to react, I saw Douglas's jaws wrap around the creature's neck followed by a loud snap. The beast stumbled back and fell to the ground in a helpless mess of blood. My heart almost leapt out of my chest as Douglas turned to me with that same stupid grin he always had on his face. His razor-sharp teeth were covered in blood. I bounded out to where he stood, coming face to face with him, looking directly into his golden eyes. He broke my stare and looked down at the creature he had just defeated and then back to me. Slowly and cautiously, he lifted his paw and placed it on my shoulder gently. A huge, toothy grin spread across his face as he managed to grunt out one word. Partner. I am a different kind of police officer. I got my partner involved in something he doesn't quite understand. Part 8. Well, let's get straight into that. Well, I'll be damned, was all my pop could mutter after we returned from the old oak. They stood waiting on the porch as we pushed from one another, laughing and approaching them. We told my grandfather and Tess about the horned fucker and how Douglas had taken it out on his own. He stood there completely invested in our story as we took turns telling him of what had happened. I was still completely in awe of the events that had transpired. Not only did Douglas manage to control his transformation, but he single-handedly took out one of those abominations. My grandfather was unable to believe the control that Douglas had shown. It's nothing like I've ever seen in all my years, son. You have a gift. Douglas's smile widened as he looked to me. Right. I don't know what happened. As soon as I turned, I felt totally in control, and it's as if my instincts took me directly to where that Jersey Devil-looking bitch was. A confused look spread across his face. He shook his head and looked to my pop. I'm guessing that ugly-ass thing's got something to do with your buddy who's playing Frankenstein. My grandfather nodded. Douglas, my pop, began. You said your run into the beast was instinctual. Douglas shrugged. It's like I knew where the threat was and my body just took me there. My grandfather sighed and sat on the porch steps. I knew what my grandfather was thinking. Somehow Douglas could be connected to these monsters, being able to sense where they were in the vicinity. That ability could come in quite handy when dealing with the creatures and finding their cultish leader. Humans who are bitten and somehow manage to survive are often connected to the sire in one way or another. Maybe when Douglas was bitten, this connection manifested itself physically. It was a possibility that he could sense when any of those creatures were in the area, giving us quite the advantage over our new threat. After that night, we practiced his shift every day. He showed nothing but complete control over his new abilities, much to my grandfather's shock. Fortunately, this enabled me to witness his strengths and weaknesses firsthand. Douglas, in his panther form, was not as strong as my grandfather or I. He could not uproot a tree from the ground and toss it like I could, but what he lacked in strength, he made up for in speed. He was much faster and had incredible reaction speed, and we found this out as we ran at Tess. You owe me a coffee for the next month if I outrun you, Rye. Right? Douglas laughed as he shifted. We lined up at the porch and my grandfather and Tess looked on. Okay, boys, my grandfather piped up. 
It's a simple one mile straight ahead to the oak tree and back. I looked over at Douglas, baring my teeth in a teasing sneer. Tess laughed loudly at our attempt to be menacing towards one another. Ready? Go! Douglas ran past me so fast that I only managed to catch a blur of black fur. I dug my claws deep into the earth and dropped down to all fours. Even on two legs, my partner was insanely quick. Before I even reached the oak, he had again passed me. This time I caught a glimpse of teeth as he flashed me a quick smirk. By the time I had reached the porch again, he had changed back into his clothes and was sitting next to my pop. They were eyeing me and chuckling as I approached. Arsehole, don't make me wipe that stupid ass smirk off your face. I laughed as I begrudgingly changed back and joined them on the porch. Now that's an idea, my pop said as he stood up. One on one, staying within the perimeters of the backyard. I looked around. It was a decent amount of land to work with, but not enough for Douglas to simply outrun me. I'm in. Douglas stood and burst into his slender form. I smiled and changed, meeting him eye to eye. Okay, boys, here are the rules. One, do not leave the yard. He nodded towards Douglas. Two, the winner is the first to compin the other to the ground. Fight fairly, guys. We stood about 200 feet apart, both standing on two legs. Tess stood in the middle of us, a huge smile spread across her face. The sun was beginning to set, so her eyesight would be put to the test as well. I looked across the distance and met Douglas's bright yellow eyes. And Tess raised her hand and threw it to the downward motion, and it was on. I rushed Douglas head on, and just as I thought I had reached him, he disappeared. As I looked to my right and then to my left, I felt a force smash into me from behind. Douglas swept me off my feet and onto the ground. He clawed at my face and I put my arms up to guard my eyes. I grabbed him as he began to move positions and tossed him to the side. He hit the ground hard. I immediately got up on top of him and attempted to pin his arms to the ground. His limbs flailed so quickly that I couldn't get a good hold on them. He shot out from under me. I had a choke hold around my neck before I had a chance to think. He tightened his hold and squeezed. I managed to slip my claws under his right arm and break his hold. As we fought, my focus was completely attuned to Douglas. Instead of rushing out the way, as I made a last attempt to rush him, Douglas stopped dead in his tracks. His eyes whipped over to the tree line, and my sight followed his, as I too made eye contact with a pair of blood-red monstrous eyes in the darkness of the forest. Vernon stared back from the trees as a sharp grin snapped across his face. Fellas, it's about time we had met. I'm a different kind of police officer. I got my partner involved in something he doesn't quite understand. Part 9. Let's get straight into that. Have you ever heard the saying that your whole life flashes before your eyes before you die? And that you see the best moments of the time that you had on this earth, all in a flash? I must have been close to death because I saw it all. My life's memories pulled my thoughts and for a moment I was in a state of bliss, forgetting the situation that was unfolding in front of my eyes. That bliss, however, was short-lived. Before I knew what was happening, my grandfather was standing between Vernon in the tree line and Douglas and I near the porch. My pop's eyes were glaring. He now engulfed almost entirely by a bright crimson. He began to shake as his anger overtook his body. He transformed so quickly that it caught me off guard and a snarl ripped from his maw. You have no business here, Vernon, he said in between low, violent growls. Ah, Victor, Vernon smiled. Nice to see you again, old friend, he chuckled with a deep sense of evil behind his laugh. But I am not here to speak with you. Rather, I am here to speak with your son and his new, hmm, pet, he spat. I immediately shifted and snarled and looked to my side to see Douglas changed, eyes fixed on the figure outlined by the moonlight. As Vernon stepped from the darkness of the forest surrounding him, I saw exactly what kind of monster he really was. Out of each side of his head stood two large antlers. His enormous body was a monstrosity. 
His long arms equipped with talon-like fingers, sharp razors lined in his reptilian scalp body. He stood on two huge hooves in place of his feet, and his face was that of mine and my grandfather's. A wolf. As he took a step closer, my grandfather did as well, growing angrier by the minute. I saw his primal, animalistic nature take command. He was producing a warning, and it did not seem like Vernon was concerned in the slightest. Careful, Victor. He inched closer. I'm not here for a fight, just to talk. He snapped his eyes over to mine. Ah, Ryan, you've turned out to be quite the specimen. He looked me over. Strong, valiant, proud, just like your pops here. He nodded towards my grandfather. I suppose we will have to see if you are as stubborn as he. Surprisingly, he changed back to his human form and sat on the ground with a smirk on his face. My pop wouldn't attack him in this form, and he knew it. My grandfather continued snarling and kept his eyes glued to Vernon, as did Douglas and I. Boys, listen. He began with a deep inhale. I am actually here to speak to you, Ryan. I cocked my head to the side curiously. Do you know that you inherit these territories after your father steps down as leader? I nodded, keeping a stern eye contact as he spoke. I knew this, although it wasn't a huge concern of mine. I was next in line in the lineage of bloodlines that extends back to the first of my kind. Historically, I was indeed the heir to my grandfather's lands. However, this did not mean that I would change any rules that my grandfather had put in place. On my land, you address me, my grandfather roared. It shook me to my core, as I have never heard him in this form of aggression before. Vernon nodded. I am here to address the officers here, old man. I walked up beside my father and changed to my human form, curious as to where he was leading this conversation. You are on the case of the bodies found in the warehouses, no? I looked back to my partner still in form and teeth bared. We are, my partner and I. You know, the one your little fucked up cult followers bit. I began to feel the heat in my chest and anger began to build. You almost killed my fucking partner. You let your little weird ass hybrid shits kill the citizens of this territory. That you're not even supposed to be inhabiting. I was seeing red as my voice grew deep and I stomped forward, my body changing as I moved forward. You almost got my grandfather killed. And in an instant, I knew... I knew what was happening to me. Rage, anger, pent-up emotions. I was losing control. Every bit of aggression I'd held back all these years was coming to the surface, all directed strictly at Vernon. I had tunnel vision, and he was the only thing in my crosshairs. At that moment, I blacked out, filled to the brim with fury. Every bit of emotion that I had held back to prevent from losing control was released, letting the monster take over my body. I awoke, covered in crimson and the scent of copper overtook my nostrils. I was in my human form and my entire body hurt. My vision was blurry and I was able to make out two silhouettes standing above me, looking down. As my sight began to come back, I noticed that the two people were my pop and Tess. Oh, what the hell is Douglas? I mumbled, my voice cracking with every word. I could hardly breathe, and speaking was even harder. Ryan, my grandfather stooped down to my eye level. You lost it. You beat the shit out of Vernon. Douglas and I jumped in a fight as we began to overpower you. Vernon tried to escape, but your partner chased after him. He shook his head slowly. He hasn't come back yet, Rye. It's been four hours. I lifted my bloody and tattered body as Tess handed me a change of clothes. We know why he is after you, Ryan, she began. He doesn't want those murders to be solved. He wants this territory for himself. He told you after you went primal. I stood upright and felt dizzy. I have to go after him. Tess, if Vernon doesn't want this case to be solved, you know he will want to get rid of Douglas and I. My grandfather interjected. I won't let you go alone, Ryan. He has your partner where he is hiding out. He stopped and thought deeply for a minute. 
Tess and I will come with you, but we are going to need some backup. There's no telling how many of those creatures Vernon has fucked up. He pulled out his phone. Let me make a few calls, see who we can dig up. Tess and I sat on the porch quietly. I was the first to speak up, knowing that she knew what I was wondering. How, how bad was it, Tess? I looked over at her, and she put her face in her hands. Oh, Ryan, it was bad. I'm not going to lie to you. You let the beast completely take over. She looked back to me. You were a monster. You were terrifying. I had only seen one of you change that way. Your grandfather, back in 99. But don't be too hard on yourself. You did what needed to be done. You got him pretty good, she smiled. He's scared. You overpowered him. He's been thinking of himself as a god. And you knocked him down a few levels. He can be killed. I'm sorry you had to see that, Tess. I dropped my head in my hands. I felt a light touch as Tess put a hand on my shoulder. Darling, it has to be released every now and then. If it doesn't, well, you could lose it and hurt somebody you love. She frowned. I could see her thoughts running wild, imagining me as a crazed predator hurting the people that I care about. Hurting her. I'd never hurt you, Tess. You know that. She laid her head on my shoulder. I know it, honey. I know it. We sat in silence as the sun rose in the sky, illuminating the tree line in front of us. I had to get Douglas back if Vernon hadn't killed him already, but those horrid thoughts lingered in my mind. How many of those fuckers had he made? Could he have made some cult army ready to attack at his command? Would we even survive up against an army? As these thoughts raced through my mind, I noticed loud, booming laughter coming from the front of the house. I snapped my head in a direction and stood up in full alert. From around the corner of the house walked some of the most biggest badass looking guys I have ever seen, followed behind by my grandfather. All at once they began to shift. I changed as well as I strode past my grandfather, meeting the biggest of the group face to face. I've never been the brightest crayon in the box. In a low, muffled voice, he spoke. Calm down, son. He raised a huge brown hairy claw to my shoulder, and a strong, toothy grin appeared across his bear-like face. We're here for the hunt. I'm a different kind of police officer. I got my partner into this mess, and now I'm going to get him out. Part 10. Let's get straight into that. These guys were the real fucking deal. Standing in front of me were five of the biggest, scariest looking creatures I had ever seen. Scars riddled their bodies, telling long forgotten stories of incredibly intense battles in times past. I came to learn their names and their stories as I had to know that they were on our side. The first and biggest guy that I initially confronted was Randolph. Pop called him Randy. He was a werebear, standing around nine feet tall, with massive biceps and a foul mouth to match. Randy had been directly beneath my grandfather's supervision back in the day. Next up was Alec, the Russian, who was a werewolf like me. The biggest difference was his fur. He had a solid white coat and glaring orange eyes. His snout had slanted scars from the top across his nose, down to the bottom of his chin. He also wore an eye patch, and I soon found out he'd lost his right eye, years ago, in a fight. The last three were the most surprising of them all. Supposedly, they were brothers, and looked to be of an Asian descent. Enzo, Lorin, and Urso were were-tigers, with dirty orange and black streaked fur. They shared similar scars to the others, but barely spoke any words at all. Uh, they're quiet bastards, Randy told me. But they're the most deadly trio I've come across in my 70 years on this planet. And none of them looked to be in their 70s. They looked to be in their 40s at most, even with their rugged appearance. We sat around the porch as my grandfather explained the situation to the men in their human forms. So, the bastard's back after all these years, huh? Randy huffed and looked to Pop. I thought we roughed him up enough to send him hightailing out of the country. Evidently, he's got a load of those fuckers up on a mountain somewhere. My Pop nodded towards me. 
and he's got his partner too. Human? Randy looked to me in confusion. Well, he was, I nodded. At uh, one point anyway. One of those assholes bit him. Randy looked over to the other four, a surprised look upon his face. Ugh, he survived, yes? Alex piped up. His accent was heavy, but also kind of intimidating. He survived. Trust me, I couldn't believe it myself. The fella is in complete control, my pop added. Randy was the first to stand up and take charge of the situation. Brothers, we owe Victor our lives. I think we can all agree to that. The others nodded in unison. We also owe Vernon an arse beating. No, we owe Vernon a death sentence. He looked to me. This man has done horrible things, taken innocent lives. He will not claim another. Not as long as there's a breath in my body. I do not know why this group owed a great debt to my grandfather. All I knew was that it was a great enough that they would risk their lives for it. I did, however, find out why they wanted Vernon so badly. As the story goes, Randy's lover had been taken in the night and mutilated beyond belief. Vernon was the culprit. Supposedly, it was also a bit of a homophobe as well. He was disgusted with Randy and his partner's affection and murdered him in cold blood. The others had similar stories of loved ones being taken for one reason or another and killed. In the triplets case though, the youngest Yuso had been captured, yet survived. The other brothers had killed every mutated hybrid in the vicinity to save their sibling. These guys had dealt with Vernon before and had reasons to deal with him again. Unfinished business. We waited until nightfall to set our plans into motion. My grandfather and Randy were to get the scent from Vernon's blood from our fight and to track his path back to the hideaway. They would then secure the area and watch our backs until the rest of us could reach the entrance. Following their scent, Tess would form a barrier around the area so that no one could get in or out. And with the plan set, they were off. I watched as Randy and my grandfather disappeared into the dark forest. They had immediately picked up a scent I stood in form next to Alec and the brothers as we waited in silence, listening intently to the noises of the forest around us. The air was still and grave, mirroring the looks on the faces around me. Tess stood behind me with a tight grip on my arm. Immediately after we heard my grandfather's howl, we took chase. The brothers dropped down onto four legs and silently slipped through the darkness ahead of us. I was amazed at how quiet they were in full sprint. Alec and I ran behind them, dodging limbs and tree trunks. Tess picked up the rear at a steady pace. I had never seen her use her magic to a great extent before, so watching her follow us to an imminent danger frightened me a bit. I followed the brothers through a dense forest on the steep side of a nearby mountain. Even though I was concerned about Randy and my grandfather, we were told that if the situation became overpowering, then my grandfather would howl twice. We hadn't heard a second howl, thankfully. After 20 minutes of steady climbing uphill, we heard the sound of a fight. Adrenaline pumped through my veins as the brothers flanked off to each side, leaving Yuso, Alec, Tess and I to run head first into the fight. When we burst through the clearing, I could not believe what I was seeing. In the moonlight of the clearing stood a terrifying Randy as he knelt down and ripped the throat out of one of the creatures. My grandfather was next to him, making eye contact with us as we came into view. Bodies of disfigured beings lay strewn all around us. It looked like a massacre. Directly ahead stood a large iron door that was built into the mountain top, looking like a modern day bunker. My pop and Randy met us with blood covered teeth, smiling in the moonlight. Randy looked worried briefly. Enzo and Lauren? Those two bastards popped up beside us without making a sound, scaring us all half to death in the process. Fuck, guys. I've told you about sneaking up on us like that. You little fuckers are going to give me a stroke one of these days. My grandfather huffed as he regained his composure. And without any emotion on their faces, Enzo and Lorin shrugged. And I swear, I caught a flash of a smile on Yuso's face. We all simultaneously turned our heads to face the entrance of the bunker. Tess moved to the front and began to swirl her hands majestically through the air, looking as if she was dancing in a trance. A silver glow shot out of her hands and enclosed around the bunker and the surrounding side of the mountain. 
She looked back to us with a wide smile across her face. Boys, ain't nobody slipping out of here unnoticed. Once you are inside, I will hold the spell in place. You've got one hour. I can hold it until then. She looked across our faces, stopping and looking me directly in the eyes. And please, be careful. There's this entrance here. My grandfather pointed to the metal door. And another entrance on top. We've circled the area and there's no back exit. He pointed to me. You know tactics when it comes to entering a dangerous building. I nodded. You give directions on how to handle this. He motioned for me to stand in front of the group. I took a deep breath, taking in consideration the little we knew about the bunker. I need three to take the top exit. Rip the lid off and enter carefully. I motioned to the brothers who nodded once in agreement. Randy and Alec, when we enter, you secure off the left and Pop and I will take the right. They all nodded in agreement. Everyone inside is hostile. Treat them as such. I said as a deep rage burned inside my chest. My partner is in there somewhere. I'm sure of it. You have the description of him I gave you earlier. We have two objectives here today. Extract Douglas and exterminate the other fuckers. My grandfather added in, As for Vernon, keep him alive if at all possible. We have other plans for him. The darkness overtook the group as I realized what he meant. As for this door, I continued, a confused look on my face as I attempted to move the heavy lock. It would not budge. Alex spoke up with a smile spreading across his face. Already ahead of you, Abir. From out of his cargo pocket, he pulled what looked like two huge barbells connected with a wire. Oh, fuck, Randy spat, followed by a chuckle. You're gonna want to stand back, way back. We all shifted as Tess kept the glow across the entrance, leaving an opening to the main door and I assumed the top exit as well. In our bestial forms, we stood back nearer to the tree line as Alec placed the barbells outside of the entrance, and I swear I heard the massive wolf chuckle to himself. He held a wire in his claws that connected as he moved to us with what looked like a switch grasped in his paw. We had no idea what we'd find behind the doors, and one thing was for sure, we were ready. My grandfather took the switch from Alec in his claws and looked around to us, his eyes glowing in darkness as his teeth flashed an eerie smile. He grunted as we all braced ourselves. Fuck. Them. Up. Wow, 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 wow. Have another one. Wow. Absolutely awesome. Chest pounding. Wonderfully, wonderfully written there by a big bad wolf. As ever, guys and girls, you know the drill. Please do take time to check out their wonderful reddits. I'll leave the link to that in the description box below. Where you can leave an upvote and a, a comment. It really helps them build their presence as a writer on the Reddit app. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really, really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, why not hashtag Team Fear. I hope you're all feeling great this week and getting stuck in to work or studying, whatever it is that you're doing. Got a busy schedule ahead for you this week, guys, so look forward to that. But as ever, remember, be safe, not sorry.